All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. Hi and welcome to the Kiss FAQ podcast. To me, it's uh, today. It's just me and Mark, and we're going to focus on the Kiss riff, and we're going to focus on the non-makeup era of Kiss. So it's from Lick It Up to Carnival of Souls. And by the way, hello, Mark, and welcome to the show. Hello, Daniel. How are you doing today? I'm just fine, and I hope you do. You're 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 fine as well. And uh, your first pick. When it comes to the the Kiss riff, you know, many people think about the seventies Kiss when you talk about the riff, but we've managed to find some stuff uh, from the non makeup era. And your first pick from which record is it? Uh, actually, you're gonna need to help me with that because I don't remember which one I put in which <laughs> order. So you're gonna have to tell me which one I actually picked first. But yeah, I think we'll talk about with. It. Yeah, we'll start with a with a barn burner from Animalize, a Gene Simmons song, Burn ah. Bitch Burn. Yes, so it's funny, most people when they hear me say that I would pick this would probably laugh because I it's not really exactly the song that I like. It's not it's not this album is sort of the, not like my favorite Kiss record, but Gene always comes up with these really cool riffs. I never have a problem with Gene's songs musically. It's always sort of the lyrics that I find that are sort of you know, humorous in how he writes them, right? But Gene is always known to do these kind of really cool, like, riffs. Like this. Okay. So it's it's really simple, but it's very powerful. Gene always says that he'd rather hear a big A chord than a hundred thousand notes. So I understand how he kind of comes up with the ideas of his writing of riffs. Th that was on my short list as as well. You know the. <laughs> That part is so freaking cool, but what's uh, bringing the the song down is, of course, the lyrics, and also I think the chorus is pretty weak. And then, of course, the classic lyric: "Burn, bitch, burn, <laughs> burn, bitch, burn." Yeah, but the riff, I I just wish they could have done something more with that, with that song because that's one of my favorite Gene Simmons riffs out of the 80s. Yeah, yes, for sure. Yeah, but, but you mentioned you weren't a fan of, of his uh, lyrics and I actually saved a moment from a previous episode that I want you to, to watch. So have a look at this. It's about you talking about Burn Bitch Burn. One of your favorite riffs from the 80s, but the <laughs> lyrics. Look at this. Burn Bitch Burn is terrible. It's one of the worst songs Gene ever wrote. Okay? It's a hot mean, take. <laughs> long, long in the fireplace. Like, come on, man. Like, oh, that, that is so stupid, the lyrics that he wrote for this song. It's unbelievable. Christmas song. And, and, and to think that he's a, Paul could have sat there Fire voice. and hit the back of the <laughs> with a straight face on this. Un unbelievable. You know, just it's just utter dribble. Just crap. Okay? It should be erased from all Kiss history, this song. Okay? Wow. The fact that it's going to be <laughs> is an insult to watching you. Okay? <laughs> So my vote is for watching you. Oh. Yeah, watching you has one of those guitar riffs that's got me reaching for a guitar yes. right there. It, it, it burn, bitch, burn mm -hmm. has me reaching for the power plug. Toilet you paper. Know. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
<laughs> I think that was awesome. Mark on a rant. I always love love it when you when you go on a rant. Uh, <laughs> but actually, I have to agree with you when it comes to the lyrics to Burnbridge Burden. I mean, even as a you know, English is my second language. But I think I would have come up with something better than that. Than yeah, what he did for this song. And it's unfortunate that that riff is kind of you know wasted in a bad song. But I do agree that's one of the best riffs from Gene in the eighties. Anything yeah. more you want to add about Burn, Bitch, Burn? Um, again, I I just think that it's it has it has such great potential. Just like you said, I mean, if they if they would have if it would the riff in the chorus would have been as strong as the verse, then it would have been even that much better. And then maybe the lyrics would have been forgotten how bad they were because you would be so interested in the music and so invested in it. So, you know, that's the problem with Gene. He, he'll come up with something good and then just for the sake of finishing it, he'll just quickly slap some stuff together and then it's done. You know what I mean? So I wish he would take more uh, effort in doing it like he did later in, in the uh, later albums like Revenge and stuff like that. Yeah, agreed 100%. So that was the first riff, Burn, Bitch, Burn from Animal Eyes. Yes. And you'll notice that some of the albums from the 80s won't get a single pick. And we'll talk about that later on. But my first pick is actually from the next album that Kiss released in 85. Mm. And it's Secretly Cruel. Ah. Uh, one of Gene's songs off of... Uh, um, Asylum, so so far only Gene songs. Ken will love this. <laughs> you know, Ken is a big supporter of Gene. Yes. Uh, yeah. He's a uh, Gene man. Hell yeah. And uh, I actually dis rediscovered this with, you know, that cover that, that the, some guy called Vertigo or something did. Where, where yeah, he, Double he, Vertigo. Yeah. He did, did this song in sort of a 70s style. And mm. that was probably the first time I noticed the the main riff and how cool it was. It goes something like this. So I, I always like that riff, you know, I don't know what it reminded me of, but the first, the first uh, part of it, this is, is really cool. You know, that first part of the riff. Yeah, I, I yeah. Always, I always like that first part and uh, mm, s sort of, a, you know, a, a rocker and a real memorable riff and when I did my list, I discovered I had a whole lot of Gene Simmons songs <laughs> on my list. So it was a bit of a surprise because mainly I, I like mostly Paul songs, but Paul never wrote a riff like this. <laughs> I don't remember the end of it. I, I misplayed it a little bit, but but you get the hang of it. Yeah, such yeah. A, su such a cool, such a cool riff, and most of the time, Asylum. I remember back in the day, Asylum was kind of overlooked as an album. But I know you like it, I like it, and I know Julian Gill of the Kiss FAQ podcast also enjoy this album. Mainly, uh, the cover of the album and the look of the album. Uh, may throw up throw off some people i think because if you really listen to the songs there are plenty of good songs both from gene and paul if yes absolutely to, yeah if you go back to animalize uh, like you did burn Bitch, burn burn Bitch, burn is probably the best gene song on that album and most of his other songs are crap uh, but yeah. on asylum he stepped it up he stepped it up I don't know why and what happened between the albums because it's such a short amount of time but i do enjoy almost every gene song on asylum while the only one i can stand on animalize i think is burn bitch burn yeah uh, so so secretly cruel is my 
number five pick. And what do you have to say about Secretly Cool? Do you like the um, song? I, I, I'm the same way like you, because I mean, as you know, Asylum is my favorite uh, unmasked Kiss record of all time. I mean, it's my number one non-makeup record. So every song on that record is just perfect. Well, perfect, near perfect to me. So, uh, and I think that Paul Stanley did a great produ production job on that. And Secretly Cruel is one of those songs that I think Gene, again, puts a lot more effort in than he did on the record before, just like he said, right? And uh, it, it, you can tell because the quality of the parts are higher on Asylum than they are in Animalize, for sure. I mean, the, the chorus even is much better just in, even in the song that you just played, much better than Burn, Bitch, Burn. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Okay, so let's move on to pick number four. And you have chosen a song from Asylum. Ah. And it's, it's the lead single. Tears ah, yes. are falling. Why did you pick this one? This is one of the songs that got me into the album immediately. I remember seeing the video when it came out on MTV. And I know it's hard to miss it. You know, all the colorful outfits and, you know, the, 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 what, the, you know, the shower sequences and Paul with his little window wiper things there. And, you know, it, 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 and, and back then, yeah. And back then, Paul was playing those BC Rich guitars. I'll never forget that. He had like those Iron Bird bc riches and those those really interesting shaped guitars i remember back then i really wanted to get a bc rich like warlock and a and an iron bird and all those ones but i could never find them here in my stores the closest that i got i had a bc rich strat like a stratocaster shape but it was okay. a bc rich one so I, I bought it immediately because of paul stanley right <laughs> yeah so but tears are falling is one of those songs that uh unlike gene where Gene seems to do like riffs. Gene's more like about, you know, like he'll do more like riff stuff. Paul yeah. is much more about, he'll do a riff, but it's much, there's much more feel to it. Like, and for example, like this song. So it's, it doesn't have to be overly riffy and complicated for it to be very catchy because that whole that whole E string part there, the, like when you have the, the drum beat behind it and the bass doubling yeah. that, it's so powerful just that, you know, that when you put those chords over it and, and the, you got to remember with Paul too, he likes having a lot of space to do these melodies. So if you're doing stuff like, you know, like, and you're going all crazy, it's hard to make these melodies. Like if you just go, it's easy to go, Amen. like you can make all these great melodies over top of it because it's not being all covered up with a bunch of other things, right? So that's always I think I find with Paul. He likes to keep his verses a bit simpler so that he can do his great singing over top of it, right? Yeah, and the singing on that song is over the top. What I do enjoy as well on that song is uh, Eric Carr's drumming. I like the way he plays yeah. sort of a sort of an unorthodox way of playing the chorus with the with the toms, you know. Bum 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 yeah. bum 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 bum. He plays a lot of toms in that song. And um I do enjoy it. And you mentioned the video. When we had an episode a few weeks back, we talked about our influences. And both me and Julian said that the Tears Are Falling video was a big influence. So I guess that video did a whole lot and made a whole lot of new KISS fans back in the day. So it was a success and I know it was very popular on MTV. 
Unfortunately, they couldn't follow it up. With, so, who wants to be lonely and uh, all night didn't do that much. Even yeah. Though, even though I enjoy those songs as well, especially "Who Wants to Be Lonely," I think it's a, it's a great song. Uh, yeah. And a pretty cool riff as well on on that song. So Tears of Foreign, one of the classics from the 80s, and what a way to follow up, lick it up, and have some fire, and get a third hit from the non-makeup era. So it was a, a cool cool song. Yeah, and unfor- absolutely. Unfortunately, they didn't play it a whole lot on this last run, you know, the, the, the end of the road tour. Mm. Uh, but they have played it from time to time, but I always thought, that uh, Tommy had some problems trying to nail the Bruce Kulick solo. Mm. Uh, I don't think he really managed to, to, you know, play it with the same feel as Bruce Kulick. So fortunately, we get to see the the Tears of Falling song played by Bruce Kulick and his band on, on the Kiss Cruise, and it sounds fantastic. And I think he didn't play it they played a few weeks back at some sort of what was it called kiss fights cancer or something like that oh yeah 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 but they played uh, alive three and that's a big mistake by kiss they didn't include tears of falling on alive three yeah instead yeah. they 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 picked songs like domino and uh, i just wanna i mean what the heck and, tears are yeah. falling are way better and it's funny because if you listen, there's there's a there's a bootleg, a great soundboard recording from Detroit, I believe, on that tour from uh, Revenge when they were recording a live three. And Paul Stanley says one night, he goes, we're going to play this song for you tonight. And if it turns out good, it's going to make the album. And it was Tears Are Falling. They played on the in the show. But and the, and it turned out great. The, the, the performance of it is perfect. I have no idea why they didn't use it because it sounded fantastic. So. No, it's really a strange decision they they made, but it will it wouldn't be the first time they made a pre-stage yeah, decision. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. So unfortunately, it wasn't included on Alive Three. Uh, my favorite um, version of the song was played in Japan a few years later in '95 in Tokyo. Mm. Yes. There's a great sounding version of uh, Tears Are Falling from Tokyo '95 that you can find out there. Uh, soundboard recording sounds awesome uh, but i guess the band was so proud about revenge you know they were so proud about their current album so they wanted to include as many songs as possible because domino and i just wanna and i know take it off was included here over here in europe none of those songs stood the test of time in the set list at least even though take it off is pretty cool i with all the dancers and stuff yeah yeah okay <laughs> my second pick i have to go to the asylum album once again <laughs> uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see how many songs that end up uh, from the asylum album and maybe how many picks we have from the heart in the shade album we'll see at the end so my next one is loves a deadly weapon ah. and i know when we ranked this album you had this pretty close to the bottom of uh, your picks it wasn't one of your favorites i think but uh, i do like the riff let's see now loves the deadly weapon it's uh, gene at times likes to do this kind of descending riff oh yeah uh, he's done it pretty uh, and loves the deadly weapon it's a perfect example but i do like it let's see uh it's like uh, it's sort of a chaotic riff yeah uh, and and i do like some of the chaotic gene simmons rough fast paced songs more so than paul's fast songs like he tried uh, on his album he had that raider full love yeah uh, one of my favorites and uh, and i'm alive i think is a pretty fast one pretty good but 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 I do like some of Gene's fast songs, and this mm. is one of them. You know, 
it's sort of a chaotic riff, kind of hard to play, and the descending guitar, I kind of like that. I, I think he reused it on some of the later albums, like, isn't it on Back in the Stone Age or something like that? He has yeah, it is, the yeah. Same. yeah, 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 so it's, yeah. Go I was ahead. gonna say he 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 likes to do use that sort of chromatic down thing that he did. He, he did he does that a lot on songs, you know. Yeah, and I I think it's a cool way to start the song, and um, I remember playing this album as a little boy and thinking this was heavy as hell, you know, really hard and heavy song. Yeah, uh, m maybe not so much these days, but I still enjoy the song. And uh, come to think of it, Asylum is probably one of the few 80s records that I can listen from start to finish without skipping a single song. Maybe I'll skip um, Raider, Raider for Love. Yeah, that's that's the worst song on the album, but it's not that bad. It's not like something off the Elder or, or no, you know, like it Mr. Black or something. And Love is a Deadly Weapon is not a bad song. The only reason why I, I, it ranked so low for me is because I really love the early version that they did on the, in the set. You know, when on the Creatures of the Night expanded yeah. version, they did a version of their Pulse. Love's a Deadly Weapon. That version, I really loved love that version of it. And when I heard this version, <clears throat> it was so much faster and there was double bass and everything. I was like, wow, it's so different from the original version. You know, when I really got into the, the song was when I heard these, uh, some sort of demo tracks from, from the Asylum recordings or f f stuff recorded in a four track studio. Um, you, may, you were able to get a hold of it through the bootleg market uh, mm. back in the day. And I remember an early version of this song uh, that I really liked with, with Gene. And, Come to think of it, a lot of the riffs that I like, I've heard like in in earlier versions where the 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 riff is more upfront. You know, it can be kind of buried in the mix at times, but when you hear an early version, you really hear the riff. And a later pick that I have today was the same thing. I heard a, a demo version or a four track studio recording, and oh. That's how the riff sound yeah. sounds great. So, so I think those kind of recordings are very valuable for Kiss fan. And uh, so, loves a deadly weapon, Asylum once again. <laughs> uh, and now, Mark is going to play one of his picks, and we're going to have a pick from from another album. We haven't had anything from this album yet, and it's from Lick It Up. Not ah. for the innocent. A Gene song once again. A Gene song. A Gene song. Funny enough, uh, but yeah, this is a, this is another example of a very moody sort of uh, song by Gene. Uh, it, it's funny because it's it's, it's on Lick It Up, so you wouldn't be uh, you know hard pressed to think that when he wrote this that he, he might have still been thinking Demon Gene still with the makeup. Yeah. Because it very much sounds like something that he could have sang in that character, right? Uh, and the beginning of the song is really simple. It just has this sort of like, let's see if I can even try to replicate it here, where he has like kind of an effect on his guitar where he does like a. And then, it, then after he plays that, it, it swells in, right? Thank you. 
So yeah, it's 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 really cool. And again, it it relies more on that heavy E picking there that you that yeah. you do on there. And and again, with Gene Simmons, he he likes his E's, he likes his A's, he likes his G's. You know, so it's very uh, very simple, but it has always has a good attitude to it. Well, wasn't that recorded for the Creatures Sessions? Yes, it was, because yeah. there's a version of it with Paul and Gene singing it as well, so, right? So, so why do you think they didn't include it on Creatures? I mean, they only have nine songs. I, I, it's, it's a really good question. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I wonder if maybe they didn't like the... I don't know if they didn't like the idea of sp splitting the vocals. I don't know if they, they just thought that... The only thing that would seem logical to me would be maybe they thought okay we have already so many good songs on creatures why don't we save this one for the next record and they already had a good song ready for the next album right you, you never know right with these guys no. but it, it is such a fantastic song it, it's not like it wouldn't fit i think it would have fit on creatures no. perfectly perfectly yeah it would have fit uh yeah it would fit like a glove yeah <laughs> yes yes <laughs> actually so not for the innocent another gene one uh such a great song and i guess if you're watching the podcast you're probably a big kiss fan so if you heard the the early versions with paul mm. singing the chorus sounds kind of cool yeah. yeah okay my turn then or do you have anything more to add to not no that, that that's that's it. that's it yeah so now we move on to a later record actually revenge 1992 uh our friend Lonnie's favorite album, so he'll be happy we'll, we, we're including some songs off of that album. And Tough Love was never a standout track to me until I heard mm -hmm. that four track demo or what, what the heck it was uh, with Bruce's Tasty Lick, you know? Mm. Uh, and this is Bruce Kulick's only co write on Revenge, and I guess he's the man behind the riff. It sounds like Bruce. And um, it's kind of a cool riff. Uh, Unfortunately, the, the chorus, once again, much like Burn Bitch Burn, the chorus is really not up, up to par, and um, the song is, you know, kind of a throwaway. It's pretty good, but but it could have been more. It could have been a better song with a, a better chorus. But I like the riff. It goes something, something like this. Uh, and I have to show my Eric Singer pick here that I play with. <laughs> yes. A stage plate pick. like that Bruce Kulick riff, you know the Such a heavy riff. Such a heavy riff, but unfortunately it didn't really translate into a heavy song. More excited, you know, that chorus. Uh, it's a decent song and really when you listen to Rich, there aren't a lot of throwaways i think it's a pretty good album maybe spit isn't that good or favorites but tough love a, dec a decent song but what a cool riff by bruce kulik uh, unfortunately he had to stand back a little bit because they brought back a member of the family on that album <laughs> if you remember if you recall you know that vinnie vincent made a comeback and actually did some tasty work on unholy i guess his 
behind the lyrics a lot in that song, I think, because the lyrics are awesome in Unholy. It's not very Gene Simmons like, you know, yeah. there's no burn, bitch, burn. I mean, the lyrics no. in Unholy are so great. And the riffing, I mean, he and Gene probably came up with some parts uh, and it was a collaboration. But but the lyrics, I think Vinnie Vincent is is all over all over those lyrics. So uh, tough love, great song. And what do you have to say about tough love? Did you ever think about the the, the riff in that song? Um, yeah, I mean Bruce Kulick has has a definite style to his playing as well. So I mean that 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 in a, a heart of chrome also is another song that I think has kind of symbolic, you know, signature Bruce Kulick parts in there as well. Uh, it, it's a good song. I mean, definitely all of Revenge is very much a pretty strong record guitar wise too. And it also has probably Bruce Kulick's best sounding lead sound as well for yeah. guitar solos. Yeah, the sonics on Revenge are, you know, still to this day feel, you know, really good. Uh, yeah, very modern sounding still to this day. Maybe one of the best sounding albums in my mind. If you if you want them to sound heavy and clear, I think Revenge is a perfect example of that. So I guess Bob Esfrin did something right, huh? Yeah, that's probably the one record that I think that he did a good job on as far as, you know, the, the sound of it can't be denied. I mean, it's good. But then again, you know, he he didn't do those things that I, that I get annoyed with when mm -hmm. he works on record. Like he didn't put any piano under, underneath that or anything like that, right? He kept it pretty much heavy and he and you know he wanted to make it a, a record of that time because in the 90s you know the, there was a lot of heavy guitars a lot of bands like pantera and stuff like that around too so you wanted to make sure that they didn't sound weak right have you watched any of the pantera videos lately because they they're they've been on the road now for for some time with Zach wild and yeah have you, have you seen that yeah yeah i've been watching some of it i think it's pretty good and, and apparently I think uh, on the fifteenth, so three days from now, they're having a, they're doing a huge announcement apparently on Pantera.com. I think they're going to be making a new Pantera album. That would be pretty cool. I think it, I think it's a good way to pay homage to to the, the yeah. drummer and the guitarist who passed away. Yeah. And and the way the, the guitarist passed away was so unfortunate and so awful. Yeah, I know. It, it was, was unbelievable. Stage. That that was pretty awful. Oh my my lord! Yeah, I I, mean, I remember when it happened. I could believe my ears when I when I heard it. So uh, fortunately, that doesn't happen that often. Uh, but Pantera still to this day a very vital band. With I think it's the drummer from Anthrax and Sack Wild. And yeah. you know, Sack Wild is. Have you ever heard Sack Wild's version versions of Black Sabbath? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I I've heard some of that. It, it's good. Uh, it's just his voice is the thing that I, I had to get used to with that because uh, uh, somebody, one of my friends used to say it, it reminded him of Leonard Sabbath. Like instead of Leonard Skinner, it's like Leonard Sabbath. Like it's, he sounds like Leonard Skinner, you know. Talking about Sabbath, have you ever heard Mac Sabbath? I've I've heard of them, but I haven't really heard much of their stuff. <laughs> it's pretty cool, man. If you're into um, you know Kiss and Sabbath, I think it's a pretty good match between the, the two the two bands because there's a lot of visuals going on. It's mainly a band consisting of uh, you know what's the name of that J that guy from McDonald's, their mascot, Ron Ronald McDonald or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the singer is dressed like him, and you have a other mascots playing the guitar and uh, um, and actually the drummer is in Peter Chris makeup, and they you know redo the lyrics so it's about how awful McDonald's and those kind of companies are to their employees, and they play really hard, heavy versions of Black Sabbath. And the guy who's singing, he has like, he, he's making burgers while he's singing and he, he's eating bats and uh, all kinds of stuff happening. So check out Max Sabbath if you have, if you have some time over. I, I think you won't be disappointed. So that was Tough Love. Let's move on to another song off of Revenge. And Mark has picked 
the lead of track unholy <laughs> why well i remember never, never forget the first time i heard this album was at a friend's house and he put it on his record player and he said hey mark check this out he didn't tell me what it was and then as soon as i started hearing that fading of the, like, the guitars all the mm -hmm. all that stuff that started fading and i was like what is this and all of a sudden, when that riff kicked in, I was like, "Wow, this is like unbelievable! What is this?" And he told me it was Kiss. But as soon as I, well, as soon as I heard Gene start singing, it was re recognizable. But I just didn't want my brain didn't want to believe that that was Kiss because before that we had like Hot in the Shade, which is like ugh, not that good. And then we also had Crazy Nights before, which is a lot more poppier, right? So this was a lot more heavier sounding, right? So. But the riff is fantastic, though. The, the yeah. riff is just... So yeah, it's, it's really cool. I it, there's very very much elements of like Gene Simmons in that for sure, and Vinnie Vincent a lot I think too. Like the, the, like, but again, when you were like you were talking about with Gene before that descending chromatic thing that we have it there too. Yeah. So he has like that descending thing, but that but that's very much Gene Simmons right there. But that video also was so cool and so creepy for that song. I mean, nobody thought at that time that, you know, Kiss had it in them to do something mm -hmm. like that. You know, people were like, wow, this is like, like so cool and so of the time. You know, people were always thinking that Kiss were so dinosaur and so done yeah. already at that time. And when they came out with that, people were like actually in shock, I think. Yeah, I recall that video as well and um, being shocked myself. I thought it was one of the best things I've ever seen, and and I don't think I've heard, I, I had heard the song previously either. So my first uh, uh, experience of the song was the video on MTV late at night as well. So it it fit perfect, and uh, I think at least my friends. I think I guess I was in high school or or somewhere around there, uh, and uh, people actually appreciated the song much as you said. Previously, Kiss was considered a, a, a extinct dinosaur. I would say. Yeah. No. Yeah. But uh, that song, people respected that song, and instead of being dinosaurs, they became respected veterans, at least among the the people I I hung out with. So it was an important song for Kiss. Unfortunately, it didn't do a whole lot on on. You know, it, it didn't go top 10 or so, anything like that, but uh, yeah, uh, it's still a gem in the catalog. And uh, I think probably one of his best songs ever, I'd say. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay, let's see. What do we have left now? Yeah, my turn. Let's move on mm -hmm. to this one. Oh, oh it's, a, it's a silent once again. <laughs> yes, this is a good song. And yeah, I, I wouldn't have fixed so many Kiss songs from Gene doing this, but I guess he's pretty good at writing riffs. It's the lyrics that, you know, mess up things. Yeah. And anyway, you slice it, uh, goes something like this. Uh, it's so fun playing. Mm. It's also a fast Gene song. <laughs>
that's such a cool i always love that riff uh of course it's pretty similar to other riffs that you've heard like um if you go to live two mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty similar to all what's the name of it all american all american man yeah <laughs> And burn, deep purples burn. Yeah, course. definitely. Yeah, definitely some inspiration from them, those songs. But uh, I think he managed to make it his own. And this is a song that not too many people pay attention to. But go and listen to the riff because I think that's one of his best riffs from the eighties. And uh, such a fun song, like most of his songs on this album. Once again, I think I have three picks. From Asylum, and it's all <laughs> all Gene Simmons songs. Yeah, uh, none of these were any singles or something like that, or anything like that. Uh, these were these are considered deep tracks, I'd say, uh, deep cuts. Uh, so, but the fans know them, and I hope that you manage to hear the greatness of the Gene Simmons riffs on Asylum. Don't get fooled by that ugly cover. It's a great album <laughs> and great songs, both from Paul and Gene. Uh, so, so what's your take on any way you slice it? I actually like it. I mean, it's the second song on the album. It comes right after King of the Mountain, which which is such a great opening song on an album. And you know, right out right after that, you you have that song come in. I mean, I, I really liked it. I always think that it's it it was a good number two song on the record. It it keeps the pace up. It doesn't let down. It doesn't you know slow down at all. And of of course, the, it, Gene has to put in that kind of humorous ending to it again. You know, you ain't your mama's little that whole blues thing. You know, oh uh, uh, yeah. You know that whole blues thing at the end there that he does right. And it, once again, a, des a descending you know yeah thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's it's fun. It's funny that he couldn't resist to put that in there at the end as well for, for a song like that and, and it, as funny as it sounds it does actually suit it and it does show some interesting vocal range of gene as well on that song as well so you know he's he's a better singer than people give him credit for and he's a better bass player than people give him credit for i'm sure yeah so we didn't pick any of the singles yeah we, you picked tears are falling but when we when we listen to this album together and and ranked it i think king of the mountain was one of the songs that ranked really high but once again there's not a whole lot of riffing to going on in that song even though it's probably one of the top two songs and yeah. the same goes for some of the other paul Stanley songs so so when it comes to riffs i think king of the mountain is my favorite song off of the album but but it's not my favorite riff so it's a different thing uh, and that's all we have from Asylum today, but we do have two more songs left and Mark will go into a song from Lick It Up, this one. Yes. Now we were just talking about opening songs like King of the Mountain and this song is another great example of a good opening song. You know, you need to have something that's kind of upbeat and catches your ear immediately. And this again, I remember forget the first time I heard it, I was like, wow, what is that? Like that opening line at the beginning. And this is because back in the early days when I heard this record, I was pretty young and I hadn't been playing guitar for very long at that point. So I had no idea how he was getting that sound. But basically all that is, is he just puts an effect on, I think like a flanger or something. And he just runs his finger up the, the, the neck, like with the... Yeah. So yeah, so basically, it's it's again another one of those Paul Stanley sort of ideas where he keeps the verses pretty simple, 
so that again he can do that kind of fantastic singing that he's known for, right? And it, it it's 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 such a great great vibe to it. The feel of it is so good. Again, with that whole flanger at the beginning with that that sliding note at the top, the harmonics that he has there, it, it sounds so cool doing that. And Paul and Gene both like to sing on either E or A. That's always what they love to go over. I mean, rarely will you hear them doing something like C sharp, like right. That's like that's like Detroit Rock City. In the old days, they did you know some of these other keys, but rarely do they ever keep in those kind of keys. I still love it. It's that a different. Yeah, that's thing. also. So that's also C sharp there. That's C sharp, yeah. And mm. what a great tune, yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, excited. One more of Paul Stanley's great opening tracks. He managed to put out quite a few of them, you know, from Creatures of Night, all through the 80s, actually. Creatures of Night, Exciter, uh, I've Had Enough Into the Fire, and King of the Mountain. And yeah. Then, then maybe it dropped off a little bit. And as you can tell, we don't have any riff from Crazy Nights. <laughs> no. We don't have any riff from Hard in the Shade. And I don't think uh, uh, there's a reason behind that. You know, there's a reason. Yeah, behind that. If he, if, sure. he would pick, if he would pick a riff from Crazy Nights or Hard in the Shade, do you know any riff from, from those songs that, that you could, those albums that you could play? I'm trying to think. Uh... <laughs> I don't think. I've played much of those songs at all. Yeah, I nothing comes to mind actually. Nothing comes I'm trying to no. think of like I mean you you would think with see this is this is this shows you how poor a record like Hot in the Shade is. There's 15 songs on this album and I can't think of one riff off of it on guitar. You know? No. The only one that sticks out is Julian Gill's favorite track. Uh, <laughs> what's the name of it? D um, ah, what's the name of that? Rise to it? No, the other one that he hates. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, oh, what, Boomerang? <laughs> no, the other one. The Paul Stanley song, the red oh, uh, song. Is read, my, read My Body? Uh, yeah, read, read My Body. Read My Body, yeah. Diddly, um, read My Body. Da, 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 da. There's a riff in there somewhere that I think I almost remember, but that's about it. <laughs> so, 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 this is why those two albums doesn't stand really the test of. They don't stand the test. Of yeah. Time. I don't think there's a whole lot of good guitar playing and riffing on those albums. Even though I like some of the songs, uh, I mean, I heard Crazy Crazy Nights live. When was that? Uh, a few years back on one of their tours. It sounded great live. Uh, and it's always been a crowd pleaser over here in Europe. You know, it's been pretty popular. And there are some, some great songs. I know you, but you've always talked about that song, which is called Turn on the Night. Yeah. You've never, I, you never play that one. I've never played, I never learned okay. it. I, I, I don't no. have a clue how it goes. But I mean, it's it's just one of those songs what that I like listening to. But it's so deep in the album too. That's the thing that kind of sucks is that it's like near the end of the record too. You know. Yeah. yeah and I promised you, Mark, I would show you a brief clip about people praising Mark Anthony on of the Kiss FAQ podcast. Okay. So I have to include that before before I go to my final pick, and uh, I'll translate this, but. Uh, a week or two back, I listened to a Kiss, a Swedish Kiss podcast, and they actually talked about our podcast. Den, den som jag gillar där annars, det är han kan dansa den, Mark. För uh, han, han vågar ju alltid säga, han, ja, han såg ett ny podden en gång hos yeah. oss också. Ja, för att han, 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 han vågar säga vad han tycker och inte är rädd med att de amerikanerna där. 
Okay, I just cut it off before I started talking about the Americans because <laughs> he didn't enjoy them as much. So, mm. but, but what he said was actually he liked the way you were honest in your opinions and that you really told it as it is. Uh, you, 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 you expressed an opinion, you weren't afraid of um, speaking your mind. And I do have to agree. Uh, I think that's one of your strong points because you're not afraid of a, you know, pe what people will say or so on. Of course, it's more fun if people say good things about you than bad things. But you need to stay true to your own, to yourself. You know, you, you need to stand your ground and express your opinion and don't fake it and don't try to think of what everything, what what everyone else will will think of what you're saying. Then you, you're, you're limiting yourself, yeah. and the podcast will become pretty you know, boring. So I think it's important that you continue with those kind of, you know, rants that you do at <laughs> times. I think they're pretty entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's good to. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that the ahead. whole point with that is that I, I think that I like to be honest about what I think about the band. Like, I always find it interesting that people think that if I say something negative about Kiss, that it shows that I don't like the band. Actually, it's the complete opposite. I, I, I'm saying it because I want to love the band even more. I, I sometimes think that if I say something about it, that maybe, you know, th it'll click in, you know, th th they'll hear it and they'll realize, because, you know, pe people, they say that they, they listen to their fans. Gene Simmons always says, we listen to the fans. Well, if they listen to the fans, then not all the stuff they do is good. And if they hear people saying what they don't like about it, maybe they might do something to change it, right? I know that's being sort of, you know, optimistic thinking saying that but you know I, I i like a lot of bands like rush is my favorite band but there are things about rush records that i don't like as well it doesn't mean i don't like the band it just means that i'm not gonna just simply say oh everything is great when it's not i i have to be honest to what i like or what i don't like and just because you don't like something doesn't mean that you don't like that band or you don't like that artist Yeah, true that. And I think it's important that you don't think a whole lot about what other people will think about what you're saying. Because at times when you get into the KISS world, I mean, you want to land interviews, you want to get in contact with different persons, and then you start thinking about what you're saying. And that's yeah. been the down that's actually been the downfall of some of the the better KISS podcasts because they've they've started to think about Oh, I can't say this because then Eric Singer or Tomothe will get pissed and then I can't, you know, keep up yeah. the friendship or the contact that I have built up. So that's the thing with getting too big as a podcast, you you get limited. So yeah. it's important that you continue to to tell it like it is. So thanks yeah. for that. Okay, my final pick is actually from the Lick It Up album. If you nice. have to take a guess, Mark. What do you think? Which song have I picked? Hmm. I, 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 it, it, it would think that it may be a difficult choice, but it's not. It's It's got to be Fits Like a Glove, your favorite song of all. all right. Yeah, when I go through her, it's just like a Of course, you yes. were correct. It fits like a glove. Probably one of my favorite riffs of all time when it comes to Kiss. And it goes up. And, and the thing I showed there was from Detroit 1990, when he actually he does he do the he does the scream. Yeah. You know, instead of letting the audience do it, I love when he does the scream. So. I go through her it's just like uh, a hot knife through okay do it mark but, uh...
Oh, such a cool riff. <laughs> and uh, I love that riff. I don't know why really, but, but there's something about it. And once again, Gene Simmons. So Gene Simmons takes the cake, you know, he, he's been all over this episode. I don't know how many songs Paul got in, but it wasn't too many. Uh, Gene dominated, and I guess that says something. Uh, he's pretty good at writing these riffs. And I have to show you one more thing, Mark, and that is I got to see Fits Like a Glove love, uh, live. Yes. I never thought I would be able to see it. So back in 2018, he was in Stockholm, and I went to the show, and he actually did a version of the of the scream I'll show you. <laughs> oh, that's me that's me going yes. crazy at the show so so such a great song such a great riff uh, and i do love the gene simmons solo band i wish he, he could can do it one more time after kiss call calls it a day calls it calls it the quits so so we'll see him once more uh because i sure as hell would like to see that one more time so what do you what do you say about Fist Like a Glove? I don't, I know it's not one of your top picks off of Lick It Up. No, but I mean it, it is very catchy, obviously. I mean, and it's one of those songs that they played pretty much on every tour, I think, right up until probably what, Revenge, I think. I think that, that was the only tour they didn't play it on. So it's obviously a favorite for the band, and it's obviously a favorite for the audience because they wouldn't continue to play it if, if it didn't. And again, it's not not a very hard riff, but then again, all the good ones are usually more simple, right? I mean, you want you want to make you don't want to make it too complicated because then you can't, you know, you can't st you can't stomp your foot to it or you can't clap along to it. You know what I mean? It's that that's the thing that people don't realize. While I like bands like Dream Theater and all these other technical bands, but they have a lot of parts in there that are like really an odd time and stuff like that, and you can't really groove to that. It's you know you get all disjointed from their you know nine eight time and eleven fifteen uh, and all these weird time signatures that they do you know keep it simple stupid yes yeah that's right uh, so that's our top five picks from lick it up to carnival of souls carnival of souls didn't get a pick either come to think of it no, yeah no track no track of of that album probably my favorite off of that album would be take a look in the mirror i think that's a mm. pretty cool riff uh, but if we t think about the 70s, could you play for me maybe your top three riffs from the 70s or three riffs that come to mind just when we sit here? So we okay, give let some me love think here. to the 70s as well. Okay, let me think. Uh... I'll think of three as well. Okay. This isn't prepared, so. Yeah, it's not prepared, but. No. Uh... <laughs> Uh, hmm. Start with oh. one, and that, then I'll do one. Okay, I, I'm thinking of one uh, right now. So let me think of. Cool. Shocked me. What about this one? There's so many cool riffs in that song. Yeah, that's a cool one. Or, yeah, yeah. Mm. 
Firehouse. <laughs> That's a fun one. What about this one then? Yes, Cold that's Gym. A that's a, yeah, that's a great one. Give me uh, another one. Let's see. Uh... Oops. Yeah, go. watching you is pretty cool. Uh, I was a bit surprised when they included that on Live 3, but, but that's a cool version of it. Uh, it's a kind of a strange sounding riff, but it, it, it works fine. Uh, what about this one then? Rock and roll yeah. over. Take, That's a great one. Take me. Yeah, I like that one. And the final one from Mark Anthony. Okay. Uh... Oh. There you go. Yeah, with the flanger effect, that one is really, really cool. Rocket Drive with Ace Frehley. And you all know out there that Ace Frehley is about to release his new album, 10,000 Volts. Yes. Let's see if that's anything up to par, if it's anywhere near the 7 to 8 album. Many people that have heard it seem to like it, and it seems to be one of his better ones. So let's, uh, you know, Hope that it's uh, somewhere in the vicinity of trouble walking, at least uh, a good one. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah, so, Mark, I think that's about it. The time we have today, we went through the 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 riffs we liked from the '80s and early '90s. And when I made you think of '70s riffs, you didn't have to think a lot because there's loads of cool riffs in the '70s. I think it's a bit harder to find them, you know, in in the no makeup era. But we managed to pick ten cool riffs. And I hope you guys out there enjoyed it. And please uh, talk about, oh, re, um, tell us about your favorite riffs. Yes. And, and write some some something in the comments. It would be great to hear what kind of riffs you like from this era. I mean, it's easy to find in the seventies, but from Lick It Up to Carnival mm. Souls, have we yeah. missed out on any good riffs? Please tell us. So from Mark and me, peace out. See you the next. Thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.